of things for PostgreSQL specifically. And we also serve a lot of customers who are running poolers or maybe who should be running poolers. Um, but before we get into that, this slide set is already uploaded. So if you want to get the slides, you can just open that QR code and you don't need to take pictures during the talk. But you can also just find them in the schedule. No secret link here. Everybody done? Looks like it. Huh? All right. I hope that worked for that guy. So let's get into the introduction. What is a pooler, first of all? Well, a pooler is a middleware, and we take usually more connections from clients and somehow mix them into less connections to the database server. Well, you can have poolers for different things, for different tools, but today we're talking about PostgreSQL poolers. And why would we might need to use a pooler? We might need to use a pooler because we have an application that is maybe not very well designed or maybe because the architecture is a bit weird. This is my personal subjective opinion, of course, but, but you probably know some applications that you would like to improve, but you can't. And so what are some common problems that we can solve with poolers? Well, the first one is that there are simply too many connections. So imagine you run an application that runs on a web server, for example. You're running multiple instances of that application, so maybe every instance opens up 50 connections, and then you have 50 more of those instances. So all of them, in the end, need to be connected to the database, and that's way too many connections, probably. Well, my mask doesn't check out, but maybe you're running into more than 9,000 connections, so you need to increase it to over 9,000, which can be a problem. There are several complications here. So when you have that many connections, there are performance regressions when it comes to, to handling all of this concurrency. There are some things relating to even idle transactions or connections. So you might be saying, I have 9,000 connections, but only 10 of them are active at any time. But in older Postgres versions, there were significant drawbacks when you were dealing with such a workload because there were a lot of things that need to iterate over all the currently active connections, regardless of if they are idle or not. And this has been resolved to some degree in PG14, but the problem is not completely over yet. There are also other limitations, like every connection needs at least two megabytes of memory, regardless of if it ever did anything. You might just open a connection, and those two megabytes roughly are allocated, and you can't use them for anything else. And there are still a lot of functions that need to iterate over all the connections. So that's bad. Another problem is when you have too short connection lifetime. So your application might create a new connection to the database whenever it starts, whenever it wants to run a query, and closes that connection to the database as soon as it's done. Um, maybe the motivation for that is that you don't want to lose track of all your connections. So you decide to play it safe and just open the connections when you need them and close them immediately afterwards. The problem here is that opening and closing, well, principally the opening of new connections to PostgreSQL is very expensive because you need to fork a new process. PostgreSQL runs a process module, um, runs a, um, yeah, the concurrency um, mechanism in PostgreSQL is based on processes instead of threads, for example. This is to isolate certain uh, processes from each other. So if one process encounters a segmentation fault, it does not tear everything else down, but there's a chance for graceful recovery, sort of graceful at least. And there are other costs in addition to this forking of new processes. There is connection setup cost. There is a cost for authentication. Um, your session needs to be tied into shared memory, and you need to load certain objects into that session, like the rel cache. 
all of that takes time. But the opposite end of the spectrum, where you have very long-running connections, is also very bad. Well, depending on what you do, it's bad or very bad. Um, because, well, let's say your application just opens up connections and then never closes them, or only closes them at the end of when the, the application is done. So you start your application, it allocates all the connections, and when you stop the application, then it closes all the connections. This might be guided by the same principle. You don't want to lose track of your connections, so you just allocate a fixed number of those and hopefully never run into, into losing any, any transactions, um, any sessions. Because if you leak sessions, obviously that's also a problem because at some point then your applications can't connect at all. But this kind of application also leads to problems. The first and more severe problem is cache bloat because every connection or every session in PostgreSQL has a local cache where it keeps, for example, metadata on table definitions on type definitions and so on. It keeps this metadata, this cache, for everything that you have accessed in the lifetime of this connection. So you are more likely to run into these issues if you are, for example, using partitioning, where you have lots and lots and lots of tables and indexes to accompany that. Or if you run some multi-tenancy that is based on schema separation, basically. Um, and usually these kinds of applications also fall on their face when they encounter database failovers or just simple connection resets because if they are not prepared to handle creation of new connections outside of that initial startup phase of the application, then they are probably not prepared to recover from any connection loss, so your application might need a restart. Then there are problems if you are running too many read-only queries, so you might be running a few write queries, your database performs quite fine with that, and you need to run a lot of read-only queries, and you know that you will be scaling up and you will be running much, much more read-only queries. So at some point, you cannot scale your PostgreSQL instance up any longer, and you will need to, to think of something else. Well, there is something that the poolers can do for us, if we can use the pooler to decide to route the read-only queries to a different replica. Usually we are already running replication for high availability, so that's quite often a cheap, a cheap escape route. There are also problems related to low connection utilization, so every connection to the database that we have will also be doing something else. Well, at least the application holding that connection will be doing something else. It needs to process the results of the query, and at least in any case, there are connection latencies as well. So if your connections are not completely utilized, then your throughput suffers, or to say the, the inverse of, of that is to say that you need more connections, need to allow more connections to reach the same throughput that you could theoretically reach with a, trend, um, with a connection that is busy 100% of the time. So if your connection is just busy 5% of the time, you might need 20 times as many connections on average to serve that same throughput. And I think this is the last problem that I'm going to talk, then we're going to talk about poolers actually, is the thundering herd problem, which in many variations everybody has probably heard about. So here the thing is, your application and your database might be running completely fine with 9,000 maximum connections. And at some point, there is a little problem. Maybe you have a long-running transaction that leads to some auto-vacuum bloat buildup and all of your other connections queries become slower. Or maybe there is some maintenance task that is supposed just to need a very short duration to acquire a log and then be done but actually it needs to wait a bit for that lock to be available, and that can then lead to all of the other workers, all of the other application connections queuing up, waiting to get their work done. And when that situation resolves, all of those 9,000 connections become um, busy again, they want to use the database again, and then you thrash the database, you run into so many issues, 
where you're context switching constantly, maybe exhausting the I.O. subsystem, and so on. And so with a pooler, you can fix this by using a queue mechanism in the pooler so that you will have this congestion build up only at the pooler level and not allow it through to pass to the database. So your database can be busy doing database stuff, and the pooler can be busy doing just the logistics of handling all of these connections, and they don't need to, um, they don't need to, to thresh over the same resources, basically. And so there are some, of course, this doesn't come for free, all of this pooling. There are some challenges to operating poolers. So misconfiguration of your pooler can lead to some downtime. And misconfiguration in the case of the pool mode, if you set it to transaction pooling, which we'll get into a bit later, um, can actually break your application or at least lead to unexpected results. This can happen whenever you do anything that crosses transaction boundaries. Well, maybe, maybe I should explain the idea of the transaction pooling. The usual pooling mode is that you pool sessions, connections. So the application opens a connection to the pooler. The pooler then routes that connection through to the database. And when the application is eventually done using that connection, it closes its connection to the pooler. But the pooler can keep its connection to the database and then give that connection to some other client connection that is coming in. And when you're running transaction level pooling, then you would, hold on, let me take a sip here. You would only make this connection from a client connection to a server connection, to a database server connection, whenever the client wants to run a transaction. And so when that transaction is committed or rolled back, that connection can be used by a different con uh, transaction. And this means that anything that crosses these transaction boundaries will at least run into unexpected behavior because you might be um, preparing statements, you might be creating temporary tables, and as soon as your transaction finishes, and then a bit later you do the next step, you try to work on that temporary table, you get connected to a different server connection and that server connection doesn't know anything about your prepared uh, statement, your temporary table, or, for example, advisory logs that you might be using. And some other challenges are that you need to manage authentication now not only on the database, but you also need to manage it in the pooler, obviously. And um, there are more things to troubleshoot, simply. There are connection issues, like authentication issues, you don't know if you're dealing with a problem that is between you and the pooler, or between the pooler and the database. You need to troubleshoot many more problems about connections being interrupted and so on. And there are also certain drawbacks to using poolers. There is, by necessity, something needs to be processed, shoveled from one socket to another socket in the easiest sense. There is some overhead, obviously, in every pooler. Um, and whenever you introduce additional network hops, if you place that pooler in a separate machine, for example, then you necessarily add additional latencies. And one thing that I, as a database administrator, also in some parts of my work, find very annoying is that you lose insights into where your connections are coming from. So in the PostgreSQL log, the host address for the connections that are coming in would only reflect the host addresses of the pooler, similarly to using a HA proxy, for example. And also in PGStat activity, when you are using at the client's host address, then you would see that all connections are apparently coming from the pooler, and you can't pinpoint, for example, which application server is misbehaving in some way. And there are also in some cases, problems where PostgreSQL error messages are not properly passed through to the clients because the pooler might intercept them and, and just write them to its own log. This is something that is more different between the, the poolers, but something to be aware of, definitely. And some more drawbacks are that, um, yeah, 
because also, as I said in the, in the early definition slide, what is a pooler? They are by definition transparent. At least we hope that they are really transparent to the application so that the application thinks it's connected directly to a PostgreSQL database. And that makes it also challenging to us as users, as DBAs or whatever, to figure out are we now connected through a pooler or are we directly connected to the database? There might be some weirdness going on there. Um, and there are some tasks that should probably, you know, should definitely, in my opinion, bypass any poolers. Those tasks are any maintenance tasks. Those tasks are PG dump, PG based backup, and similar utility um, things. Because, for example, PG dump assumes that it um, can use the same connection for the whole duration of, of its operation and can rely on certain guarantees of PostgreSQL, and it can't rely on those guarantees if there is transaction-level pooling in between, for example. And you can't really use replication through a pooler either, nor does it, does it make sense, really. So now we get into actually comparing the poolers that I picked. Well, th these are some available poolers. It all started with pgpool2, which was released in 2006. Then we got PG Bouncer in 2007. Odyssey was an attempt to revitalize PG Bouncer development, basically, because it was stuck in a long <coughs> loop of, of sleep, basically, uh, in 2019. Um, and then there came some others that perhaps drew inspiration from this uh, PG Agro from 2019, and um, PG Cat from 2022, and Supervisor from 2023. And so I'll introduce each pooler here one by one and, and talk a bit about them. And then we'll run th through some comparisons, actually. So pgpool describes itself as a clustering tool for PostgreSQL. So it's called pgpool, but it's a clustering tool. Well, so first and foremost, it's called pgpool2 because it's the successor to pgpool, which I think was never used outside of, of some internal projects, which had its origin in 20, uh, 2003. And all of this was uh, started by Tatsuo Ishii, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, um, who works at SRA OSS in Japan. And um, he started the project, and then eventually it got transferred to the PGPool Global Development Group. It's released under the PGPool 2 license, which is apparently according to the documentation similar to BSD and MIT license. It's written in C99, and it's primarily a pooler. Well, not really primarily a pooler, um, with lots of additional features. So I actually have a separate slide for all the additional features. It has various replication modes. It has load balancing. It has failover support, so it can reconfigure your PostgreSQL database clusters. It has routing of read-only and writing queries, and it has a query cache even by now. So a lot of things that it can do, but that also means a lot of things to configure. And in the end, this means that in my personal opinion, configuration of pgpool2 is really very complicated, and the, the documentation even does not make it easy to understand. Which is, while well, later I'm not including pgpool2 in my, in my summary, because if you're in here just wanting to use a pooler, then pgpool2 is probably too complicated. But I hope I don't offend anybody by stating that. <laughs> the next in that list, just by age, obviously, is um, PG Bouncer that de describes itself as a lightweight connection pooler for PostgreSQL. Maybe that also gives a hint, a side uh, a bump in the direction of PG Pool 2. And it was started at Skype by Marco Kren in 2007. Coincidentally, Skype also developed a replication tool that was called Londista. Sloni, Londista, Londista, and so so that's fundamentally a different thing. So at Skype they were thinking we put these functions in different utilities, 
that's probably a good thing. There is also PGQ, which came out of Skype from the same era. And so this is where we uh, have PG Bouncer, and it's released under the ISC license, which is something I've never heard before, and that's apparently basically a stripped-down version of the MIT license and a simplified BSD license. It's written in C99, and it is only a pooler, really, not much more. That makes configuration a whole lot simpler compared to PG Pool 2. Then there's Odyssey, as already mentioned, that describes itself as a scalable PostgreSQL connection pooler. It was created by Dimitri Simonenko at Yandex in 2016. I'm also hoping I pronounced that right. And the first public release, as far as I understand, is version 1.0 in 2019. It's released under the BSD3 clause license written in C99. And it's similar to PG Bouncer, but with additional features and also multi-threading which is something that PG Bouncer doesn't have, which we'll get into a bit. Um, then there's PG Agro, named after a tourist town in Portugal, and it's, it describes itself as a high-performance protocol-level connection pooler, protocol-native connection pooler for PostgreSQL. And it was started by Jesper Pedersen, again, same disclaimer, at Red Hat in 2019. It's written, uh, released under the BSD3 clause license, written in C17, so some new fancy C features that they are using. And it's basically a pooler written from scratch, not taking into considering, uh, consideration a lot of the preconceptions that others had from working with PG Bouncer for a long time, it seems. And then there's PG Cut which describes itself as PostgreSQL pooler with sharding, load balancing, and failover support. So already a few interesting features that they crammed into their description. Uh, it was started by Lev Kokotov, again, same disclaimer, uh, at PostgreSQL ML in 2022. And it's released under the MIT license, written in Rust, and also similar to PG Bounce, but with additional features and multi-threading. And then the last one in this list of slides here is Supervisor, which describes itself as a scalable cloud-native Postgres connection cooler. Cooler. Pooler. And it was started by Stas, ABC3. I did not find his second name. Unfortunately, I would have put it on the slide here, um, but I didn't find it. Um, at Superbase in 2023. This is released under the Apache 2 license, and it's written in Elixir, which is, to me, I'm, I've turned 30 this year, but this, to me, is, is newfangled cloud stuff. Um, I'm probably very biased here, and the setup instructions seemed incomprehensible to me, which might say something about the, pro uh, the product, the solution that is supervisor, and it might say something about me, but this is also why I'm not including supervisor in the following comparison. And so I would like to start with the basics. When we create a connection, we need to authenticate. We need to authenticate to the server, and we also need to authenticate to the client. But this slide is primarily about client authentication. So one thing that they all support is an auth query, authentication query, which is that you define a certain function in the database that the pooler can call to figure out what the secret for the authentication is that is stored inside of PostgreSQL. So using an authentication query that needs a certain, certain kind of access, um, elevated access to the, to the database, but um, using such a, an authentication query, you basically do not have to maintain the, the same password for the same user in two different locations, for example. Um, and thankfully, all of these poolers su uh, support this feature. Um, then they all support MD5 authentication, and almost all of them support Scram SHA-256 authentication, which is a newer authentication method that is probably, should probably completely replace any MD5 authentication in the field, B 
because as my colleague Laurenz told perhaps a few of you earlier today, MD5 is susceptible to replay attacks. If you listen to enough handshakes between clients and PostgreSQL database server when they connect, when they go through the MD5 authentication sequence and you eavesdrop on enough connection attempts, then you have a high chance of opening your own connection to the database without ever getting into uh, possession of that MD5 secret. And unfortunately, PGCAT does not support Scramsha 256 authentication, though that is apparently on the roadmap. Then there is client certificate authentication, whereby the certificate that the client uses to connect to PostgreSQL is checked for its common name attribute. And if that common name matches the username, and of course, if the certificate authority that signed this certificate that the client is using matches the certificate authority or the chain thereof of the PostgreSQL server, only then the client is allowed to connect through. And we can use the same functionality in at least PG Bouncer and Odyssey, but apparently not in PG Agro and neither in PG Cat. Then there is, because this, uh, I found this curious, and, and I looked into also how, how do they support TLS connections. And in this case, we're looking at client to pooler connections and also pooler to server connections. So the good news is that all of these poolers support client to pooler TLS connection establishment. But the bad news is that um, for PG Agro, it does not yet support this. So you cannot make TLS connections to the PostgreSQL server. There is an issue about this, and they are probably going to work on that whenever they release version 2.0. And we get into the different features of these poolers. These are yeah, the bread and butter features. Um, most of these, yeah, some of these introduced by PG Bouncer, like the live config reload. For example, if you want to resize your pooler um, to allocate more connections, to have it open more connections to the database server, you can write that configuration change to the configuration file and just send a reload signal to the pooler. And it will apply this change without needing a restart, which is very good, of course. And all of these support this. The next thing is about pausing the pool basically. So the idea of pausing a pool is that as soon as you enter that pause mode, depending on configuration, um, all currently running connections are either allowed to finish their work or they are killed outright, and all new incoming connections are put in the wait queue. This is something that only PG Bounce and PG Cat use. The motivation for such a feature is that you can, using this, hide restarts of your PostgreSQL database server, or you can perhaps even hide failovers between um, a primary and a replica. And then the third feature in this list here is parallelism. So originally, PG Bouncer had no support for parallelism at all, just ran in a single, single loop that iterated over all the waiting backends, basically. Um, and this is what PG Agro, PG Cat, and Odyssey um, aimed to fix, and they did successfully so. And with the success of uh, prompting the PG Bouncer developers to also introduce a socket reuse feature so that you can run multiple instances of PG Bouncer on the same host, and they can bind to the same TCP socket. So your incoming connections do not know to which PG Bouncer instance they are connected. Um, the drawback of this is that these instances do not share anything. They don't share the pool, they don't share um, the queuing, um, they don't share these statistics and so on. So it becomes a little more management and also it means that you end up with more connections to PostgreSQL in the end again. There are some more features, some features that that these, um, these new contenders, the newcomers, um, some of them are already quite old again, um, 
brought to the table. The first one is support for prepared statements. This is specifically talking about prepared statements when you're using the transaction pooling mode. This is something that initially was deemed impossible according to PG Bouncer developers, but the uh, super uh, sorry, the Odyssey developers proved them wrong that th this is possible to do to some degree, and this is supported in PG Bouncer and Odyssey, and I think that's it. If you are very interested in prepared uh, statements in, in transaction level pooling, there was a not so well, in, in the not so distant past, there was a talk by Yelte Finema about comparing the support for prepared statements in poolers these days. And then there are, uh, there's a read-only feature that PGCAT introduces, which is also something that PGPool2 had on offer. Let me quickly check the time. Um, which PGPool2 also had on offer. The idea is that you try basically to guess if the next transaction or the next statement is going to be reading only or if it's going to be possibly also writing some data. The thing is, we might be tempted to just look at is the first keyword a select and send that to the read-only replica. But if you start thinking about select, select the next value from a sequence, select some function that might be writing some data or might not be writing some data, you can get into trouble sending those to the replica. You will get errors that uh, read, uh, writing transactions, writing statements are not supported on a read-only replica. Um, PGPool2 addressed this by having both a whitelist and a blacklist of queries. So depending on, on what flavor you wanted, you could um, you could say, I want these kinds of statements to always go to a replica, or I want these kinds of statements to never go to replicas. Um, PGCAT doesn't allow that to be defined yet. They are currently still searching for a solution for this problem. The thing is, something that my colleague Laurens brought up as well is that even PostgreSQL doesn't know if a statement is going to be writing or not at the time where it passes the, um, the query. You might be sending a delete with a condition, delete something from a table with a condition, and PostgreSQL will actually have to go through that table to figure out is there anything that matches this condition and do I need to delete this? If nothing matches the condition, then that delete statement is still a read-only statement, basically but you don't know until you've executed it. Um, and then there is um, load balancing support, which is something that uh, Odyssey and PGCAT support. So basically, you define multiple replicas, and I think they both have mechanisms to understand if a replica has failed or not, if we can continue sending statements to that replica or not. And the last feature here on this list is what one of the... Um, Apparently, key uh, criteria for PGCAT was is the sharding. So, I did not look too close into this, but but if you um, if you want to shard your data anyway across multiple PostgreSQL instances, then you can tell PGCAT how your sharding is happening, and PGCAT can try to be smart about sending replica, uh, sending queries that touch certain shards to those shards and not. Um, yeah, so basically this, this looks like if you start using this, this sharding feature, you're locked into PGCAT, um, but at least it's an open source project, so if ev anything ever goes wrong, you can fork it. Um, there are some differences in, in what, what we can, can configure with regards to pooling with these, uh, bar, um, these poolers. So there are session mode, there's session mode pooling, there's transaction level, you know, session level, session connection, I use these words interchangeably. Um, they mean the same thing to me. And transaction level pooling is, as I said, where you only are connected through to the database whenever you're inside a transaction. And then there is even statement level pooling, which is something that only PG Bouncer supports 
I suppose if you already support transaction level pooling, it's trivially to also support um, statement level pooling, and I suspect that this, this is a useless feature. But I don't know, maybe there is somebody in the back of the room that uses this every day. I don't know. Um, and one crucial feature to address this problem that I brought earlier, uh, brought up earlier about the very long running connections where we get cash bloat is the ability to limit the lifetime of connections, of the connections from the pooler to the server. And this is something that PG Bouncer, PG Cat, and Odyssey support, but I have found nothing in the documentation regarding PG Agro supporting any session lifetime limitations. And the idea with this uh, limitation of the lifetime is as soon as a server, a connection from the pooler to the server reaches or exceeds this lifetime limit, whenever it is done processing the last, the last connection or the last transaction, it will be killed, a replacement uh, connection will be added to the pool, and none of the, your client connections should notice this. But what you will notice is that your database does no longer crash because it runs out of memory because your backends are accumulating bloat. I mean, I've had customers that are simply restarting the application every 10 hours because otherwise they run into issues. Maybe I should bring the topic of poolers up to them. Um, the last slide here, I think, is about monitoring. It's definitely about monitoring. I'm just not sure if it's the last slide in this comparison. And because PG Bouncer is, by comparison, rather old, um, and it has a nice feature where you can connect with any, any client that speaks the PostgreSQL wire protocol. You can connect to the PG Bouncer to a specific database and run certain SQL-like commands like show stats or show pools. You can pause the pools through this connection, do some maintenance tasks and also monitoring. And this kind of monitoring, what I call PG Bouncer-like, is something that is also supported by PGCAT and Odyssey, I guess because they, they primarily drew um, inspiration from PG Bouncer, but it's not supported in PG Agro. And on the flip side, we can look at Prometheus monitoring, which is probably the most interesting one to, to a lot of people here, is that PG Bouncer doesn't have any inbuilt support for Prometheus. You can use a Prometheus exporter, of course. There is one available. Um, but all the others support this out of the box. No, there was another slide. This is about miscellaneous stuff. This is very subjective. So just from looking at the documentation, I have the feeling that PG Bouncer is the best option because PG Bouncer has all the documentation with lots and lots and lots of explanation of what each tweakable, each configurable does, and how it changes behavior. It has all of this in a single page that you can, can look up. And all the alternatives have their documentation stored away in various markdown files in their Git repositories. So you need to, to traverse different different files, it's not easy to, to interlink with the, in them, but you can try. Um, and, but there are also differences in, in the amount of uh, explanation that goes into the configuration files, and, and this is something that PG Agro is still a bit better at than PGCAT and Odyssey, I would say. But this is, very, very subjective. It's probably the case that as soon as you start using the tool, you will get more into the flow of using it, um, understanding how to configure certain things. For me, it was in some parts, and may maybe I'm wrong about some of these features being supported or not being supported, but for example, for Odyssey, um, I was looking through the documentation trying to figure out if it was supporting this statement level pooling, because in one of the issues, I saw a mention that sounded to me like it would support this, but I did not find this anywhere in the documentation, so I have to assume that it's not supported. 
And the next thing is about stability. So PG Bounce is around for a long time. It has a yeah, sort of dedicated maintenance crew um, around it. It's, it's very, very robust. It, it has, has, proven, has a proven track record, basically. You can also say that's a bad thing and, and that this, this stagnation is, is, is not leading to innovation. Um, PG Agro gets a few uh, points less here because it's currently undergoing some rewrite. They are aiming to ship a version 2.0 that is changing some substantial things. And um, this, this will likely change, change behavior as well. So I would not consider that as stable. For PG Cat, it's just very new and maybe that doesn't uh, mean it's, it's too stable. And for Odyssey, um, I, had a look at, I had a look at all the GitHub repositories. And for Odyssey, I saw a few issues that are longstanding that are probably waiting um, on a case to reproduce these bugs. And, and they are, for a long time, standing open, not fixed. Then what's interesting to me is if I can just install this from the PostgreSQL.org APT or YAM repositories, which is something that is true for PG Bouncer and PG Agro, but unfortunately not for PG Cat or Odyssey, though at least PostgreSQL operates their own APT repository that you can freely use and install PG Cat from there. And now, which one to use? This is a very subjective recommendation or maybe not even a recommendation at all. This is my gut feeling. So please don't take this too seriously. Please don't go to anybody saying, oh, your pooler is bad because some guy on the stage at PGConf told you so. <laughs> so regarding PG Bounce, I'll start off. It's probably the best idea to just use PG Bounce if you think you need a pooler. Try it out. There's not that much that can go wrong. Maybe this phrase often imitated but never uh, duplicated um, applies here to PG Bouncer. Um, there are many people from different companies contributing to PG Bouncer, so you don't run the risk, uh, risk of some company going under or some people moving jobs or just shifting focus to something else and then eventually no longer supporting um, PG Bouncer development. There are also some recent features like support for prepared statements in PG Bouncer. And if you look around, if you need support for PG Bouncer, then most DBAs probably already know PG Bouncer. They can probably set it up and get using it within a day, even if they don't know anything about it. This is also in part because PG Bouncer reuses a lot of the terminology from PostgreSQL, so if you already know how HBA host-based access in PostgreSQL works, the PG Bouncer one works very similar, though there are some minor differences. There are drawbacks of this single process um, nature of PG Bouncer, but these really only start to become a problem at rather large scales. I think if you are not continuously utilizing 100 database connections to the server, then PG Bouncer is probably completely fine for you. And how many connections you can have between the application and the PG Bouncer basically just depends on your connection utilization. And if it turns out that this doesn't scale for you, then you can still try the, um, the uh, socket reuse option, or you can also um, install multiple instances of PG Bouncer. Regarding PG Cat, I think PG Cat is probably the most serious contender here. At least, I think it's, it's one of the, the um, more interesting options here. Um, there are also different people and companies contributing it. There are success stories about using it. Um, and they seem to steadily move forward with the new features. They are actively developing new features and, and also getting them into some better state and then later putting them into properly supported state 
and it's written in Rust, so this should enable them to uh, introduce new features, easily work around all the concurrency issues that they might have. Am I already out of time, really? Well, if, if you want to allow questions, yes. <laughs> Maybe you can rush through the, the rest of the sheets. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll rush, rush through here, and, and you're probably all hungry or thirsty for the social event. Um, but yeah, Rust means this is not susceptible to, to memory leaks easily or at all. Um, PG Agrel, in my perception, seems to be stuck trying to prematurely um, optimize uh, some, some performance issues. Like there is also a dedicated performance pooling mode in PG Agrel with limited explanation on what it actually does. Well, I think there, there is like one paragraph on it. Um, the missing TLS encryption from PGAgra to the database server is a no-go in my opinion, but that might depend on your setup, on your architecture, how much you trust your network um, where you are running PGAgra. There is a lack of queuing, so with PGAgra, as soon as all the pool connections are used up, you can no longer open new connections. Whereas with PG Bouncer and PG Cat and Odyssey, you can open as many connections as you want, and they will eventually be served. But PG Agro doesn't have this, this waiting queue functionality, basically. Um, and there is also no lifetime limit for long running connections, so I think that's a bit um, bad. And also, PG Agro uses a process model. Whereas I earlier told you that the process model in PostgreSQL is a bad idea because you need to fork new backends on every connection establishment. There are some benchmarks about PGAgro, but, but nothing comparing it apparently to PGBouncer or any of the other poolers. So you will have to draw your own conclusions then. And regarding Odyssey, um, it has to be acknowledged that Odyssey started a new era of experimentation and development in this um, pooler um, space. If not for PG, uh, for Odyssey, PG Bouncer would probably still not support the socket reuse feature or it would not support prepared statements. And so um, it was definitely valuable in that regard. Um, Odyssey is primarily developed by Yandex and also I have the feeling that Yandex is the primary user of, of Odyssey, and that might in, uh, in itself be an ethical problem to some of us. Um, but there are also actual problems in Odyssey that I've seen. There are things like memory leaks in the authentication query support, um, where users are saying that they need to restart their Odyssey pullers every 12 hours to, to avoid these issues where they would otherwise run out of memory. Um, and then there are issues that I can't even understand in the Odyssey GitHub repository because they are written in Russian, or maybe they start in English and then the updates start going into Russian. And I'm sorry, I can't speak Russian, but my native language is also a different one than English. And still, whenever I try to, to work with open source projects, I stick to English. Um, and there are no packages, so we would have to build them ourselves. Maybe there can be some, some effort made to, to include, um, include Odyssey packages in, in uh, the PostgreSQL.org, APT, and YAM repositories. So some closing thoughts, if you'll allow me. There is about a minute left, not really. Um, there are cases where you just don't need a pooler, so keep it simple. I would say, and start your, start your business, whatever, without a pooler, and see how far you can go. And a lot of the wisdoms about you cannot run more than 200 connections or 300 connections is coming from those days before those PG-14 improvements. Um, and if you think you need one, just try it out. It's usually not that complicated to set up. But if you do, do lots and lots of testing, especially for correctness. And some problems that we've seen can be solved just by this connection um, or session level pooling, but some of the problems can really only be solved with transaction level pooling. For example, the um, utilization problem. And if you think about using the transaction level pooling, you should do even more 
testing. You need to understand exactly how your application works, how it uses transactions, what kind of features it uses in PostgreSQL that do break these transaction boundaries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Thank you for this excellent talk. Deutsche Gründlichkeit, würde ich sagen. Yeah? Very neat. A good talk. Yeah. Thank you. I guess we have a boatload of questions. Uh, the, gen the, the person over there, the, the black shirt, he was first. So thank you for the talk uh, and this topic. Uh, we, for, we, in my current company, we have uh, NPG SQL for some weird historical reasons and C Sharp application. And whenever we see high concurrency, uh, we see huge uh, spike in CPU. Even 96 core machine is not enough for them. Uh, and before that, I was only using PG Bouncer and did not see these kind of a performance issues. So have you compared performance at high concurrency for different uh, new, new contenders? Well, yeah, I, I think the, the PG Bounce is, is um, by design limited to how fast it can pull the socket for new events, for, for new, new queries to come in, for example. And, um, there is sort of a brick wall. Once you hit that, then your connection latencies, your query latencies run through the roof. Um, there are some things that you can try about this. I think you can improve some things about this polling. Um, and you can try the socket reuse option. That would be the easiest option. Um, I don't know. The, there is also something to be said about application level poolers. Most um, clients these days have uh, support for, for a pooler in an application. Um, or there is also in most application libraries a support to have your connection string point to two instances, for example, of PG Bouncer. So you can just list, list both of them, and the library will figure out which one of them is alive and accepting connections. Um, Just wondering uh, about session pinning, how they, you know, the different pullers uh, will handle session pinning, if they handle the session pinning. You know, uh, you have a session that is just setting some um, particular attributes for the session to modify the behavior of the backend. And well, the, the session pooling means you open a connection to the to the pooler, and as soon as that goes through, as soon as, as you get a prompt, for example, you are connected straight through to the database. So you do your business at the database for the duration of your session, of your connection, and whenever you close that connection, then there is, that's usually configurable in the poolers, uh, something that, uh, that um, the pooler will do to that server connection. So it will keep the server connection open. I think they default to just running the discard all command in that session. So that should get rid of, um, of settings where you increased work memory, for example, for your connection. Um, it should probably get rid of all the, all the um, side effects that you might think of. And this is valid for, this is valid for all the poolers you, uh, you tested and compared? Hmm? This is valid for all the poolers that you compared? I assume that all these poolers do support this. It's, it's just that they need to send a single discard all message to the PostgreSQL database, which is, I haven't looked into them, but, but I'm pretty sure that they, they do. But maybe Peter can confirm, and maybe Andre can confirm. Peter? PG Bouncer definitely does discard all when the session gets reused, yeah. unless you configure something else. And Andre, do you know if Odyssey um, runs discard all when it starts uh, reusing a session? When you want to reuse a session for a different se um, connection from client or a different transaction, PG Bouncer calls discard all. And I do assume that Odyssey also discards all. 
take the mic. So, uh, thank you. Yeah, by default, we call discard all, but yeah. you can configure what exactly you want to discard or completely turn off this discard. And it will actually, like normally, if you have uh, 100 inbound transactions, you have 200 uh, statements going to the database because you execute a statement and then discard all. This is kind of a problem, and high performance databases usually turn this feature off. Yeah. Thank you. I believe you have one more question, at least. Uh, yeah, thank you for the presentation. Uh, all right, my comment uh, dash question has to do, uh, I mean, to express some bitterness with uh, the connection pooling thing in Postgres. Uh, we're using uh, for 23 years Postgres, starting from seven. Uh, when we started considering uh, PG Bouncer, it was back in uh, 2018. At the moment, uh, it had all, uh, already support for uh, LDAP via PAM, right? Is this via PAM, right? Uh, so it was completely exotic to, to set up, and uh, you had to, for the local, some users outside the, your IRM system, which should create, you know, local Unix uh, users. PG Bouncer should run with uh, said UID. Uh, but we had on, uh, only we had only PG Bouncer. What is the question? <laughs> I will, uh, the question is that I see that PG Pool is uh, no ancient, developed forever. It has very decent LDAP, uh, you know, support, and uh, it seems very mature project. Uh, I think that it's uh, a lack of resources to to have all these fine systems, but cannot play together. And still, we the users are facing huge problems in two, 2024. Right. <laughs> okay, I suggest you do a talk next time. <laughs> Could yeah. be. Uh, there was one here in the front row, I believe. Ten minutes is over, but yeah. you're free to leave. But if no, you can, I, I can answer more questions when everybody who wants to leave has left. Hello, is it possible to use prepared statements if you use connect, uh, commit and chain in transaction mode? Do things live on then? I have no idea. You are probably you better off looking at that presentation from Yelta Fenema about comparing the support for prepared statements. Um, that is quite recent and compares at least PG Bouncer and Odyssey, I think. Okay, Julian, I guess people are getting thirsty. Yeah.